Well, greetings everyone and welcome to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. The Law Hour is sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. I'm your narrator, George Gordon. The Law Hour and Editorial Review is heard nationally and internationally seven days a week here in the United States and in more than 120 countries worldwide over the Internet. Now, for more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, please visit our webpage at georgegordon.org. Again, that's georgegordon.org. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events. So stay tuned for tonight's special report on a plan for the future right after this. Hey, if you've got a lot, 50 by 100 feet, with a 2,000 square foot house on it, You've got space then for six raised beds that will contain 2,400 square feet of growing space. That's called French intensive culture. 2,400 square feet is enough space to grow all of the food that a family of five or six will eat in one entire year. And you can do that right in the middle of the city just as easily as you can out in the country. The idea that you are trapped in the city and you cannot provide for yourself and your family because of a space limitation is a fiction. You do not need extra cash to buy tractors, plows, and harrows. What you need is a shovel, a rake, and a hoe. That's more in line with what we need for an urban, French-intensive culture farm. We don't need acres and acres, combines, or price supports from Congress. What we need are pruners, newspaper for mulch, and open pollinated seed. Now, if you've got 2,400 square feet or a backyard big enough for a decent garden, you can feed your whole family on your own land. And we have a seed package which is designed to answer your questions with the most economical and practical solutions to your long-term food needs. And it has space-saving vegetables. So you need less land, less fertilizer, less water, less mulch, and less work. And it's designed with immediate food availability, just 28 days from seed to salad. And it has flowers to attract wild pollinators because of the loss of our honeybee population to chemical sprays and disease. And it's been designed with a long harvest season to allow for fresh vegetables longer and to reduce stress by not making you can, fry, or store everything all at once. And you won't need any specialized tools, just a rake, a hoe, and a shovel, a supply of newspaper for mulch. That's enough to plant and raise every seed in the package. And a pair of clippers and a paring knife is all you need to harvest it. And this package is designed with an all-non-hybrid, non-genetically modified seed that can feed a family of five or six forever if you're sensible and save your seeds. Now, if you'd like to learn more, why don't you call and order our free general law CD package. First, that's the place to start. That's a four-hour commentary on the law in general. Now, remember, it's educational, it's informative, it's entertaining, and best of all, it's free. And you can call and order one right now. The number is 417-273-4967. Now, once more, that's area code 417 4967. Our subsistence and survival school is also available on compact disc for adult home study. If you're online, why don't you go to our website, georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. Just click onto the email and send us an email request for that free general law CD package. Once more, that's georgegordon.org or call us direct at 417 273 4967. Why don't you do it right now while you're thinking about it before you forget? All right, last time we were up to Deuteronomy chapter 28. <clears throat> I told you that in this chapter there's a story in here about uh, famine. Famine. And remember, Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26 are parallel chapters to Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, which explain Revelation chapter 6. So if that was a big mouthful for you, let me run over that one again so that you can look at this a little more at your leisure. Start off with Leviticus. That's the third book of the Bible. Leviticus, the whole chapter, 26. 
it contains two sections. First section says, here's what I'm going to give you if you do what I tell you, and here's what I'm going to do to you if you don't. There's a second chapter. It's kind of a repeat, but it contains more information than Leviticus 26, and it contains information that Leviticus 26 doesn't, and Leviticus 26 contains information that Deuteronomy 28 doesn't. Remember, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So get Deuteronomy 28 down. Same format. Tells you here's what I'm going to do for you if you follow instructions. Here's what I'm going to do to you if you don't. All right, now those two chapters are, ex are extrapolated into Matthew 24, called the Olivet Prophecy. It's repeated by Mark and Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all wrote about Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 because they got it directly from Jesus' lips. You know, he said, watch my lips. It's Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Now, <clears throat> there are 435 direct quotations in the New Testament taken from the Old. Jesus said, think not that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. And I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's in Matthew 5:17. And he said, man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the next time you hear some preacher tell you that the Old Testament's done away with, look him right in the eyeball and tell him he's a damn liar. Can you do that? That's your preacher. Look him right in the eyeball and say you're a damn liar. You can believe your preacher or you can believe Jesus. No, I don't care what you do. I just wanted to tell you that that's where the bear does it. Now, <clears throat> there's a corollary chapter. The whole book of Revelation now <clears throat> deals with these five books, but particularly Revelation chapter 6, and then particularly those four horsemen of the apocalypse, because those four horsemen over there tell us how this 90% of the world's population is going to be killed. That's the, that's the program, the Revelation chapter 6. All right, so you got six chapters there. Now, that's kind of a mouthful. Now, here's the substance of it. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 6, <clears throat> you have these four horsemen. One of them is deception. We talked about that the other day. <clears throat> then you got war. you got famine. And then you got disease. Now, <clears throat> you, need to fi you need to figure out a way <clears throat> that you can avoid deception. You want to be able to discover truth and then apply it. And the best source is the Bible, as opposed to the Ten Planks to the Communist Manifesto. The Ten Commandments do a better job for us. This thing of war, very serious. You know, you got war going on over in Iraq and Afghanistan. For the people that are living there, that's serious. For the people living in Gaza, now that's serious. You know, for us living over here in California, Washington, Oregon, it's just a story that happens way, way far away. But it's coming to a city near you. Coming to a city near you. So get ready for it, because that's why we're talking about a plan for the future. If you take a look at the political, geo-international politics today, like the Titanic, when it set sail, there was a, there was a string of events that ended up with the Titanic sinking. Each event of and by itself wasn't all that significant, but all of the events taken together caused the disaster. That's where we're headed right now. Disaster is looming on the horizon. There's, there's just little things over here, bit by bit, that we're talking about now, that are leading to a world economic collapse which then will lead to famine and starvation, which will then lead to civil unrest and then World War III. And that World War III is going to come down with nuclear bomb war. And I don't know where the nuclear bombs are going to fall, but, you know, good, you know, just a, just a good idea, you know, in the back of your mind, like New York City would be a good place for one to fall. Maybe San Francisco. I said New Orleans, San Francisco. Maybe maybe places like San Diego, Houston, Texas, Chicago, maybe. I mean, there's a lot of cities. There's a lot of targets that could be 
that could be bombed and you don't know how many are going to get bombed and how many aren't. And you don't know where you're going to be at that time without a little planning in advance. Now I'm going to zero in here on famine because famine is our single most vulnerable spot. Famine. And God has used famine to kill people by the tens of millions throughout history. I mean, it's a very common tool that the Creator uses. He uses fire and brimstone. He uses floods, but very rarely. I mean, you know, they, they come along, but they're, they're not, they don't kill as many people. You've got a big drought going on now out in the western United States. That's bad news. It's bad news because at the very same time we've got drought in the far western United States, uh, we have a reliance, a uh, dependence upon the importation of our food supplies from overseas. Half, 50%. Used to be we were an exporting nation. Now we're an importing nation of food. That's not good. That's a, that's a bad omen. That's just one of the signs. Then you got Monsanto out here, you know, with genetically altered and manipulated foods. Listen, in, uh, write this one down. This is Leviticus, Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 19. There's a specific statement, a specific statute, a specific law that says, do not hybridize your seed. Don't do that. Just because you can do it, just because you're real smart scientists over here and you learn that trick, don't do that. And so not only are we doing it, we're having it crammed down our throats by our Department of Agriculture. Our government itself is trying to force us into genetically modified foods. Hybridization has been going on, you know, for, oh, hell, 50, 75 years. But uh, this GMO thing, you know, is fairly recent, you know, in the last 20 years. Now, both of these are aiming at, just like the Titanic, aiming at down the road over here to a disaster. Not a potential disaster. It's a disaster that you can't miss. Now, here's what happens. And in a Bible prophecy, remember we've been, talk, we've been talking about this thing of prophecy. Prophecy comes from two, two sources or two forms here. One, our experience is a pretty good, is a pretty good uh, guide for us. And I pointed that out with the Titanic. I said, you know, now we put enough lifeboats on every boat and every ship that sails out of the harbor to accommodate all the people on the ship. Now, you'd have thought somebody would have thought of that in 1912, but they didn't. And so, after 1,500 people died, they said, hey, maybe we can learn from that. So, that's, that's number one. Number two, the, the Bible prophecies that we're talking about here, like Deuteronomy 28, have to be carried out by somebody that has the power to do that. I said, you know, I could make a prophecy. I could say, well... Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'm going to go to Springfield. And sure enough, tomorrow morning, I've got the power to, to bring that to pass. But when you've, got, when you've got a prophecy in here that says, I'm going to send a flood and destroy everybody on the planet except for eight people and whatever saved alive on the ark. Now, that requires somebody with a lot of power. You know, somebody that's, that, that can, you know, somebody bigger than Al Gore. You know, Al Gore says that he can set the temperature here on planet Earth. I think that's a pretty tall order, if you want my personal opinion. But yeah, he says we can control global warming. Well, okay, Al, you know, it's up to you. But but I, I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm not really sure that we men down here on planet Earth. You know, remember the Titanic was built by the low bidder, and it was the unsinkable ship. So I get a little skeptical when I hear about these unsinkable ships and these grandiose pronouncements like we can set the thermostat here on planet Earth. I get a little nervous about people like that, but then, you know, people believe it. <clears throat> and if you believe it, well, you know, keep after it, but I don't. I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm from Missouri. So I'm, I'm looking at this famine here from the perspective of the guy who says, not only is there going to be one, I'm going to guarantee it because I'm going to bring it to pass. Now, we Americans are helping with the famine by our, by our geopolitical policy makers. 
this thing of, of uh, national interdependence or global outsourcing has helped in that regard. Hybridization of seed and monoculture has steered us in a, uh, in a policy form to create uniform crops over hundreds of square miles of real estate so that if an insect gets into it, we can wipe out the whole corn crop in one year. I don't think that's wise. I don't think that's good <clears throat> public policy. But that's what Monsanto offers, and that's what the Department of Agriculture and our policymakers offer us. And we bought it. Uh, I don't think that's good. So I'm going to opt out. In fact, I did. I opted out. If you people want to depend upon monoculture and Monsanto and the Department of Agriculture, you know, don't let me get in the way of your happiness and success, but I'm going to avoid that. I'm going to produce my own food, and I'm going to do it with open pollinated seeds so that from year to year I can save my seed back and grow next year's garden, next year's food supply with the seeds that I produce myself and that I have total control over. I don't like Monsanto controlling my seed. I want to be independent, not interdependent. Now, based upon Bible prophecy, listen to this. This is a scary story. It's in Deuteronomy 28, verse 53. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I just want to read this one little section because it talks about cannibalism. A famine that is so great, so all-encompassing, that it produces a famine that results in cannibalism on a, on a grand scale in the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Now, you know, you're sitting here saying, oh my God, this guy's slipped a disc. Well, you know. Noah came along and he said, there's going to be a worldwide flood and going to kill everybody in the world. And no doubt people said, my God, you know, this man's slipped a disc. Because these events have only happened once. And this event hasn't happened yet. And there isn't any reason to believe that you're going to have a famine in Canada. You people have never had one. You're not on the verge of famine today. You've got plenty of food. Australia, New Zealand, same. Here in America, same. We're, no, there isn't any reason to believe that there's going to be a famine. The only reason that I would come to that conclusion is based upon Bible prophecy. If it wasn't for this this story here in Deuteronomy 28, I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought of it either. So listen to this. He says, "And you shall eat the fruit of your own children, the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons." and of your daughters, which the eternal your God has given you, in the siege, and in the straightness wherewith your enemy shall distress you. All right, now let's take a look at international geopolitical <coughs> trends. And this isn't the only case, but in Gilroy, California, it used to be called the garlic capital of America. And they used to produce garlic out there for the retail market. And America cost $16 a pound retail in the grocery store. The Chinese... <coughs> said, hey, we can produce it a lot cheaper than that. Now, when you're paying people, you know, six, eight, ten dollars an hour, it costs more than if you're paying them six, eight, ten dollars a day. So the Chinese could produce garlic and sell it at the retail level in America for three dollars and sixty-five cents a pound in Walmart. You know, this is ten years ago. So the choice now for you, Mr. and Mrs. Housewife in downtown Poughkeepsie or New York or Chicago, do I want to pay $16 a pound for garlic or three sixty-five? dollars Well, that's kind of a no-brainer, you know. And so our government, Department of Agriculture, and our trade representative, Mickey Cantor, and so on, they, they, they made a deal with the Chinese. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you import your stuff tariff-free. You don't have to pay any tariffs. Just bring it in, sell it. Well, Walmart picked right up on that. They said, do we want to pay, you know, $8 a pound for garlic in Gilroy and sell it for 16 Or do we want to pay a buck and a half for garlic in China and sell it for three sixty-five? Well, that's a no-brainer. Well, so here's what happens. The Chinese in, import their garlic and sell it to you, and you love it because it's saving you about, you know, round numbers, about 75%. Now, of course... <clears throat> 
the, the farmers out in Gilroy, they can't compete with that. And so they go out of business. They close down. So the, the factories out there, you know, the packing sheds and the acreage, you know, that is dedicated to garlic gets planted to something else. And those, those sheds down there, they start producing or they start working on something else or they close them down and they just uh, rust and rot to the ground. And so now we have garlic coming in from China. And everybody's happy. And as long as we pay the Chinese, they're happy. It's called international commerce. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the New World Order program. Now, what would happen, though? This, this picture this. What would happen if we had an economic crisis and we were unable to pay the Chinese? You know, what if we, we owe the Chinese a trillion dollars, and what if the Chinese said, okay, pay us? See, we've never paid those people. We, we've never sent them something for their garlic. We gave them a bunch of pieces of paper, you know, like treasury bonds, you know, and IOUs that say, you know, we owe you this, this amount of money. They haven't collected their Caterpillar tractors or their Dodge Dakota pickups or their, their Intel their computer chips. They haven't collected that yet. They're holding these pieces of paper, just like you have dollars in the bank, so you've got a checking account. You haven't collected on your checking account, but you have confidence that if you go down to Walmart and write them a check, that they'll transfer the money out of your account, and you can convert that to garlic or your wheat, corn, beans, honey, and oil and walk out of the, out of the store and take it home. What happens in the siege? What happens in the future when we're unable to make our balance of payments schedule and the Chinese then, when they don't get paid, cut us off and won't ship us any more garlic? Now take a look at this. 99% of your shoes come from outside your borders. Nearly all of your television electronics equipment comes from outside your borders. Now there's some made here in the United States, I don't deny it, but... You know, if, if we ever get shut off, which is what balance of payments is all about, which is right on the horizon, it's one of the next shoes that's going to fall. And when they cut us off like they did the Argentines and you have to go on COD, we Americans ship $200 billion a year worth of goods and import $800 billion. Now, that's a $600 billion deficit. Let's try this. Let's suppose that you're making $8,000 a month, all right? And you get cut back to $2,000 or $2,000 a month, you know, from $8,000 a month to $2,000. Now, all of a sudden, you got $6,000 a month less money to spend. Okay, now what are you going to do? Well, here in America, we just put it on our credit card. All right, now let's, let's complicate that a little bit. You max your cards out and they take them away from you. Now what are you going to do? I'll go to the bank and I'll get a loan on my house. I'll, I'll take an equity loan. Okay. But your house value has now dropped to somewhere below the amount of money you owe on it. Now what are you going to do? See, boys and girls, there comes a point in time when reality is going to smack you right between the eyes. And what's going to happen is you're going to live on that $2,000 a month, whether you like it or not. Now, you know, you're sitting here with a, with a $2,000 a month house payment, and then you're making 2000 a month. Okay. Well, you've got to eat and buy gas for the car and pay the utilities, too, see? And then you've got to service your credit card debt and blah, 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 blah. Got that? Nations have to do the same thing. And then when nations default, like the Argentines did and the Zimbabweans did, and like America is about to, oh, boy, that, that's going to get real bad real fast. That's what the siege is all about. All right, now, verse 54, it says, So that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he has nothing left him in the siege, and in the straightness wherewith your enemy shall distress you in all of your gates, gates, your seaports. 
Now the tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that comes out from between her feet, and toward her children, which she shall bear. For she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness, wherewith your enemies shall distress you in your gates. If you will not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear the glorious and fearful name, the Eternal your God. Okay, now there's the story. Wanted to share that with you. So I'm betting on this prophecy. I'm sitting here saying, I, th I think that's going to happen. And I think it's going to happen as a part and parcel of the great tribulation, which I think we're right on the threshold of. I mean, we could already be involved in it, but I, again, you know, I'm not a prophet. God isn't talking to me. All I know is what I get here in the in the affidavit, and the affidavit's, you know, fair to middle and good. Tells you just about what's going to happen. Now, in Matthew 24, Jesus made this observation. He says, hey, you look out here in the west, and you can see the, the, the sky is red, and you say, well, tomorrow's going to be a fair day. Or you look in the east, and you see the sky is red, and you say, oh, my God, there's a storm coming. And he says, you know, you can design, you, you can, you can d decide or divine the seasons and the, and, the, and the weather. He said, now, when you see these things coming to pass, you'll know that your salvation is right at the door. Second coming is coming right up. Now, this period of time lasts for 200, uh, yeah, 1260 days. Let's see if I'm right here. 1260, I'm going to divide this out. 1260. Divided by 365 is uh, 3.45 years. Yeah, that's about right. So if you take a look here in the book of Revelation, you'll see 1260 days is how long this great tribulation lasts. Three and a half years. Time, time, and a half times. It's, there are several prophecies, and it, and it tells you that it's three and a half years, which is about as long as World War II. You, know? you take a look at World War I, about four years. You know, from August of 1914 to November of 1918, you know, four years and three months. So you need to you need to plan for this. This is why I, I, I put this together. So you need to plan here for the future. And one of the big issues here, and one of the four big issues here is this famine thing. See? I don't think Americans are ready for this. Now, when it comes to war, we have not had war here in the United States. The last time we had a foreign invading army come in here that amounted to anything was the British in 1812. Pancho Villa had a little foray into New Mexico back in 1916, but, you know, that was hardly an invasion. But this book, the, the, this Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, tell us that we're going to go into national captivity. We're going to be defeated militarily. Now, you know, you take a look at the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and say, you're going to be defeated militarily. Why, we've never been defeated militarily before. Oh, we didn't fare out very well in Vietnam, but, you know, there wasn't any Vietnamese coming over here dictating to you in Sacramento, California. You know, you didn't have any foreign armies coming over here and conquering you. You you failed to conquer them, but that's that's hardly military defeat. But you saw what happened to the Germans, you know, in 1945 and and the Japanese. Now that's military defeat. When somebody takes it to you, brings it right into your front yard, and eats your lunch. Now that's that's military defeat. Now, both these chapters, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, tell you that's what's coming. So you got to put that one down and say, well, okay. <clears throat> and then you take a look at Revelation 6, and there you are. All right, now we got disease coming up. Disease. Have you taken a look here at the disease, the, 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 some of the statistics that come out, you know, from the CDC and so on? Take a look at AIDS, venereal disease. Americans are very sick people. We're sick people because we have bad food. We have a very bad health regimen here. And as a result of that, we have a, we have a wonderful medical system. I mean, God, the, the medical system in America is second to none. This is the best place in the world to get sick. 
because we've got the best medical treatments heart attack stroke you know MRIs and cat scans and all this yeah I don't deny that <clears throat> but I think good health would would probably be better and they're talking now about giving us national health care insurance I'm not quite sure that these people in Washington have their feet on the ground they sound like they're insane to me I, I just wanted to point that out I think they're nuts and the reason I say that is we can't pay our bills. There isn't any physical way that we could pay off the $10 trillion that we owe on the national debt. And then in the last 90 days, they just added another $9 trillion to it and then put it into circulation. So <clears throat> hyperinflation is absolute certainty. We, we can't miss, just like the Germans did in the 1920s. Hey. You get ready for a Weimart inflation bout, because that's that's in the that's in the bag. You can't miss with that one. But here are our politicians now telling us after we can't pay our bills, we're going to print more money. We're going to give everybody national health care insurance. I don't know why in the hell they don't give everybody a Rolls Royce or at least a Chevy Malibu. You know, I mean all they got to do is print the money. And pass it out. And by God, that'll stimulate the economy. You know, I've, I've, I just can't understand why the government, if they want to stimulate the economy, all they got to do is just write a check for every American family for about a hundred thousand bucks. God, that'll stimulate things. As soon as I get my hundred thousand dollar check, I'm going to quit work and then go spend. I'm going to Battlefield Mall and start spending. Are you going to do the same? Because if all of us had a hundred thousand bucks tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. We'd go out and buy all the goods off the shelves. And you want to know how much in the way of goods we have on the shelves? The answer is 2%. And that's what the money in circulation today, before anybody prints another dollar in the future. So you talk about Zimbabwe-type hyperinflation, boys. Bend over, because here it comes. Now, if you think that's good, well, you know, stay with the program, because you can't miss. But I don't think that's a very good idea. So I thought I'd want to do something a little bit different. I thought I'd like to buckle down, pay off all my debts, be debt-free, have a seed program with a food storage program with a piece of ground over here to sustain myself and see if I can't weather this storm and live a little better than the average Joe Sixpack. Which is why I said I think we all need a plan for the future based upon the Ten Commandment model rather than the Ten Planks to the Communist Manifesto model. Tuck that one away in your heart, and then I'll give you your mid-course reminder here for the FCC. <clears throat> and remind you that you're listening to the Law Hour and Editorial Review, sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, the Law Hour is heard seven days a week here in the United States, and we're heard around the world in more than 120 countries daily over the Internet and radio. Now, for more information about the Law School and the Law Hour, please go to our website at georgegordon.org. That's georgegordon.org. Now, the law school teaches family law, tax law, courtroom strategy and procedure, business law, agricultural law, civil rights, and biblical law from the scriptural perspective. That's eight schools and all. The law school is a private, non-commercial, non-profit, non-sectarian law school, and it is open to individuals but by prearrangement. The law school conducts a homeschooling program for adults on compact desk, and the law our website is updated weekly. It has a radio log schedule and archives all of which can be accessed through our website at georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. All of these Law Hour programs are archived on the Internet by title and date for your listening convenience, and the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. Now, the Law School offers a free four-hour introductory CD package. Be sure to order one by calling and asking for it. The number is 417 273 4967. Again, that's area code 417-273-4967. Now, the sources of information that we use on this program are true, accurate, and correct to the best of our knowledge and belief, and the Law Hour. An editorial review gives credit to those authors and publications that we use on this program, and we often endorse or recommend books, papers, periodicals, and newsletters to our listeners. Now, these endorsements or recommendations that we give don't mean that the authors and publications that we endorse will necessarily reciprocate. Keep in mind that most of these authors and publications cited here on the Law Hour and Editorial Review 
may be hostile, political, religious, economic, sectarian, racial, or ethnic partisans whose viewpoint may not be totally endorsed by the Law Hour and Editorial Review. These opinions, beliefs, comments, views, and expressions that you hear on this program are mine, they're mine alone, and they don't necessarily represent the views, beliefs, or opinions of the advertisers, sponsors, the management, or the staff of this radio network or of this local radio station. So if you'd like more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, then please go to our website, that's georgegordon.org, or you can call us direct at 417-273-4967. All right, we're talking about a plan for the future. All right, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Now, remember I told you about these these seeds? Let me give you the statute here in Leviticus 19.19. Now, here's God, the creator of the universe. This is the guy that put the germ plasm in the seeds to start with. And when he got through with uh, creation, he said, you know, this is a pretty good invention I just made here. I really like it. He said, "It's, uh, it's very good. Now, in order to protect all of this germ plasm around the world over here, you know, so that you've got a steady, reliable reproduction process in plants, you have to be careful because it is possible to hybridize. Sometimes it happens accidentally, and when it happens accidentally, it's no big deal. Whatever is hybridized will die out because it can't reproduce. And so there's a built-in... Um, there's a built-in destruction here of uh, inferior plants, uh, self-destruct. It's, it's designed that way. Now, when people like Monsanto or various and sundry seed companies come to the conclusion that they want to sell seeds and make profit and gain, they need to have something to sell. So they sell you something that's a new and improved variety. See? New and improved. Excuse me. All of these varieties were created during creation week. There's nothing new about them. They're all 6,000 years old. Every single one of them. Now, it is true that you can manipulate the gene code in these various plants. And so God comes along here in Leviticus 19.19. And he says, You shall keep my statutes, and you shall not let your cattle gender with a diverse kind. So don't crossbreed them. You shall not sow your field with mingled seed. You shall not sow your your field now with mingled seed. Now, Monsanto comes along and says, hey, we can mingle this seed. We can gene splice flounder from the North Atlantic into a tomato and make it more frost resist, resistant. God, that sounds like a good idea. Well, if you're growing tomatoes, you know, in North Dakota, a more frost resistant tomato is just the ticket, ain't it? All right, now did it ever occur to you that maybe we ought not to be growing tomatoes in North Dakota? Maybe we got things up there in North Dakota be be more profitable and, and fit the climate a little better. You know, there's certain seeds here in America. I don't know about Australia now and, and, and Canada. I think you Canadians just have one growing season and one, one growing location. It's about 200 miles north of uh, Montana, but uh, here in the United States, we have three climatic zones for growing things. We got the northern, the middle, and then the southern. That makes all the sense in the world. You can stop and think about it. Things down in Miami, Florida, <clears throat> won't grow in Bismarck, North Dakota. And conversely, there's some plants in Bismarck, North Dakota that won't grow in Miami. Strange as that may sound, you know. So some plants have to have cold and frost, you know, in the wintertime and go dormant. And then in other plants, they can't. Now, there's a guy here by the name of Gettle, a young fellow, up here in Mansfield, Missouri. In fact, he's not too far from me. And he has a company up there. He's, 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 a, he's a Baker Creek heirloom seeds, and he grows heirloom seeds, open pollinated seeds. What that means is those are seeds that have the genetic code from the Garden of Eden to today without any genetic gene splicing or manipulation. Those are called heirloom seeds. So in case you're, you're wondering, 
go to Walmart and go into their lawn and garden store and tell them you want heirloom seeds and then watch that clerk. They'll just look at you with a blank stare like, huh? Was it? Now, <clears throat> the guy's name is, uh, is Jerry Gettle. You might want to write that down. Jerry Gettle. And he, and he has a website. It's called rareseeds.com. And these are rare seeds. And this year he put out 95,000 catalogs. Now I want to show you how rare this is. 95,000 catalogs means that 95, if, if everybody that he sent a catalog to were to buy one of his seed packets or one of his seed packages, he thinks he could supply 95,000 people with seeds. Now that's far-fetched. See, he knows when he sends out 95,000 catalogs that if he can get five or 10,000 people to buy from him, he's going to be in Fat City. He knows that. So he's going to, pr he's going to produce 95,000 catalogs for 5,000 people. Now, 5,000 people translates into six people per family. That's a big family. So let's just go with six times 5,000. This guy could feed, let's get 5,000 times six, that's 30,000 people. Now, in America, there's about 300 million people. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't, know, I don't need to buy seed from this guy. I can just go down to Walmart and buy seed. You got your head up your dirty ear. You can buy seed at Walmart and you can buy seed at Baker Creek, but you can't buy heirloom seeds at Walmart. And those seeds that you buy at Walmart won't grow from the seed that you produce from that fruit. It's a dead end. And that's why God told you not to do that. Now, do you know that most of the seeds sold in America, for practical purposes, for 300 million Americans, your seed is produced by companies, you know, like Pioneer Seed in Monsanto and Northrop King. And those are big corporations. And, that, boy, they produce a lot of seed. And they produce a lot of hybridized and genetically modified seed. And then they're feeding 300 million people. And this guy Gettle over here, maybe he could feed 30,000. I've told my students this a time or two. I've got a few seeds here. I've got all the seed I need for the Gordon family. Uh, I took care of myself first. And I probably, if I put my mind to it, I could probably produce enough seed here for maybe 10 other people, 10 other families. So, you know, if ten guys came to me and they said, Hey, Gordon, could you give me some seed? Yeah, yeah, I could. How many people could I supply with seed? About ten families. Now, when you when you take a look at, we got a hundred million families here in the United States, you know, you can see that there's going to be a god-awful shortage now of heirloom seed. So now let me start off by suggesting to you that in a plan for the future, if just in case you think that maybe on an outside bet that maybe there could be some food shortages, maybe not a famine where you're going to be reduced to, to, to cannibalism, but maybe just a shortage, maybe just high prices. Maybe the price of food, you know, in our new hyperinflation economy will go double, triple, or quadruple. But guaranteed, guaranteed, your wages are not going to double, triple, or quadruple. When prices double, your wages won't. They never have, and they aren't going to. But you can rest assured that the price of tomatoes is going to double. Now, that being the case, you may be reduced to having to either get your wife to work or take on a second job, or maybe you're going to have to go out in the garden and plant a little something. Now, most of you people are gardeners. You just, just think about it. You plant bushes and shrubs, and you cut your grass. See, you people are grass growers, but you can't eat the grass. I mean, you've got a you've got a power mower, a riding lawn mower, and you, and you go down to to Walmart and you buy shrubs that you can't eat, and you plant them, and you stand back and say, "My God, that's a beautiful rose." I don't deny it; those are pretty roses. And as long as you can go down to Walmart and buy your food or down to Kroger's or Safeways and, you know, and, and at the supermarket and buy food, there's no problem, partner. But what happens one of these days if you can't? 
What happens if you get a, an Iraq or a, an Afghanistan or a Bosnia? Huh? You ever thought about that? Well, that can't happen in America. I know. I, I wouldn't believe it either. If I hadn't read it here in the Bible, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. So I'm just passing on, just as a reporter. I just want to pass on to you some information here that maybe you hadn't heard before. That there's a God in heaven. He says there's coming famine. He says he can guarantee it. You can take it to the bank. I'm going to do it to you. I'm going to do it to you because you won't do a damn thing I tell you. And I'm ticked off. And then when this God goes ballistic, he oftentimes goes postal. When you go ballistic, that means that you get real mean. But when you go postal, you get out here killing people. And this God has a history of killing people. You know, just to give you a couple of examples, Noah's flood killed everybody in the world. If that ain't going postal, you tell me what is. Send me an email. Tell me what postal means to you. He got to the Red Sea, and he had it with Pharaoh right up to his eyeballs. And he killed the entire Egyptian army right to the man, including Pharaoh himself. I yeah, like that. I know in the Ten Commandments, Yule Brenner came back. Came, no, no, no. <clears throat> Pharaoh died right there in the Red Sea. We had a change of administration right then and there. But anyway, leaving that little foible out, uh, uh, he killed all the Egyptian army. Now, Josephus says there's 450,000 men died that afternoon in about 20 minutes. So, you know, this guy has a Sodom and Gomorrah is another example of going postal, you know. Now, you know, you can play Sodomite and you can sip on your martinis and have a good time, you know, while things are going good and while you got your income coming in, you're still employed. But when you lose your job and they foreclose on your car and your house and your unemployment runs out, that's when reality comes to, comes to bear now. And it's coming to bear now for more and more of us, so pay attention. Now, I'm going to read you a letter here. I got a letter the other day from a guy, just one of many. I, I'm probably getting 10 a day like this. And people, that's why I do these programs, you know, that people call me and they say, hey, can, can you steer me in the right direction? I'm, I'm floundering around out here and I'm, I'm getting a little bit nervous. Hey, if, if you're getting nervous about the economy, if you're getting nervous about international geopolitics, well, join a club. You got a good right to be nervous. So, let's see if I can find this letter here. Wait a second here. This isn't the one I wanted. Let me put this page here and that page there and that page there and that page there. And well, I'll be darned. No, I guess I didn't bring it down here. Oh, yeah, here it is. I've been writing on it. It's my writing notepad here. He says, I've been listening to your broadcast for the past few months and followed your commentary with your suggested readings such as The Money Changer, Mr. Saxena, The International Forecaster, and The Privateer. I'll pause right there. Boy, if you're reading those four newsletters, that's a sobering experience. Now, going on, he says, I've also been following Ron Paul, Lou Rockwell, Peter Schiff, and some of the folks on Genesis Communications Network, such as Randy Kelton and Michael Bednarik. Now, I'm one of the many lemmings that followed the real estate bubble, U.S. stocks, 401k, and I work in Manhattan, and I live in the suburbs. My wife must work to keep paying the debt, and she works at the worst place of all, at J.P. Morgan Chase Home Finance Headquarters, State Housing Authority, FHA, Loan Program Creation. So we see exactly how Chase and the big banks are destroying us, and she is beginning to see that we have to escape this, and soon. We just don't exactly know how to get to zero COD in short order. I am a systems engineer for a telecom company providing pri private fiber optic networks to the top 500 banks, hedge funds, insurance, media companies in the New York City region. We have seen major changes in our business, which is actually good, as they are shedding their IT departments 
and giving us more business to run their their network. I know, however, that we will see all of this dry up about 2010 as hedge funds and more banks go bust, nationalized, and I am, uh, and I might be out of a job along with my wife. We are now waking up, but I believe we are late. And I've gotten out of the U.S. stock market. I bought silver and gold with my savings. I started to buy and store food, but I fear I'm running out of time. Could you please send me your four-hour introductory CD package as I am very interested in getting out of debt quickly and prepare myself for going into business for myself. I don't want to make income any longer and get out of debt. I want to get out of debt, interest, and paper money. I won't mention his name because he's not a student, and I don't know <clears throat> if I want to <clears throat> wanna embarrass him. I don't know that he'd be embarrassed necessarily, but I'll, I'll protect his privacy here and just tell you that he said, I think I'm late. Well, you are late. You know, all of us are late. Uh, I was out uh, yesterday working in one of my containers, and I'm working feverishly, just, just working away. So if you're out there and... And you're saying to yourself, gee, I haven't heard from Gordon for a long time. How come he doesn't call me? It's because I am working. I'm working doing just exactly what this guy's doing. I'm trying to get as many of my affairs in order, getting ready for the big bust as I possibly can. I mean, the second coming only occurs once. And there's a parable here in Matthew chapter 25 that talks about ten virgins. Ten virgins. And these ten virgins, five of them are wise and five of them are foolish. And five of them have oil for their lamps and five don't. And so this guy is writing me a letter, along with a lot of other people, by the way. And they say, gee, I'm short of oil. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too, Bob. I'm, I'm not sure I've got enough oil either. You know, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that. I'm kind of concerned about this Titanic, this great ship America, you know, with our new captain sailing at 25 knots straight into 5,000 square miles of iceberg, telling me on the news every night, we need a new stimulus package. We're not near far enough in debt. Ten trillion dollars in debt wasn't enough, so we added nine trillion more to it. Nineteen trillion dollars in debt's not enough. We need a new stimulus package of another trillion dollars. Budget deficits of a trillion dollars a year aren't enough. They may jump to two. We have nothing but budget deficits for as far as the eye can see. My God, that scares the living hell out of me. And if you ain't scared, then you ain't got any brains. You ought to go back to watching Mr. Rogers on Sesame Street. So anyway, um, I just wanted to let this guy know that you're not the only guy, partner. Uh, you think you're waking up and you think you're late. Hell, I've been doing this for 30 years. Then I think I'm a little late. You're talking about some heavy-duty stuff coming down. The Pakistanis over there are in a failed state, and the Taliban is in the process of overthrowing their government, and they got 60 nuclear weapons. Now, if that don't scare the hell out of you, go back to Mr. Rogers. I mean, we got some big problems running running around the world over here, and listening to Brian Williams makes me want to puke. You know, and Katie Couric, you know, nice lady. I don't deny that. Katie's a sweet lady, and gotta love her. But um, I wish that woman was as dumb as she sounds. But she's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and so is Brian Williams. People that belong to the CFR, the Bilderbergers, and the Trilateral Commission, those aren't ignorant, dumb people. Those are wicked, evil people. Hell, they know what's coming down the pike. And then I wanted to share one more little piece with you here. I got a note in here the other day. It came from a guy. I don't know if you're aware of this. I don't have it right in front of me. I'll just have to ad lib here. But in, in the east, near Washington, D.C., did you know that the President of the United States, the Cabinet, and all the members of Congress and the Supreme Court have an escape plan. They have an underground facility. And they have plans for subsistence and survival. Uh, 
that, that they have food stocks for four years. Did you know that? And they have underground bunkers like Hitler had in Berlin where you can't get at them so that they can run the government, you know, from underground. Well, anyway, I just got a, a little news blurb in here the other day. They are offloading right now as I speak today. They are offloading food so rapidly in one of their storage yards. They can't even put it away fast enough. And they're just unhooking the trailers and driving the tractors out and leaving the, the, the trailers there, refrigerated trailers, you know, they're, they're, they're stockpiling more food. Now, by God, when the President of the United States and the Congress are stockpiling food, you know, that sends an ominous message, you know, to us little peons down here as bottom feeders, don't you think? So I thought I'd throw that one out there for you. That's why I said I think we need a plan for the future. And this guy in New York City, now, yeah, you're late, buddy. <laughs> you're, you're late, no doubt about it. But then, hell, I'm late, and so is everybody else. Now, you might want to be thinking about, you know, speeding up your program over here a little bit. So let me help you with that. We teach two schools here at the law school to help you cut through the red tape and get down to the bottom line, the nitty-gritty. One is called subsistence and survival, and the other is how to make 100000 a year on 25 acres or less. And you need open pollinated seed for your subsistence and survival program. So I'm going to give you this guy's name and a number again. His name is uh, Jerry Gettle, G-E-T-T-L-E. He's just a little farmer up here in, uh, uh, what county is that? Is it Douglas? I think either Douglas or Texas County. I kind of forget now which he's in. <clears throat> and, he, and he's got two web pages or two websites. One's called I Dig Me or I Dig My Garden dot com. It's I D I G M Y G A R D E N dot com, which I don't care too much for. I like the rare seeds dot com better. R A R E S E E D S dot com. And I think if you went to rareseeds.com and asked for his catalog, I don't know if his catalog is free or not. I'm looking at his catalog right now, and I don't see a price on it. But if you'll go to their website, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, B-A-K-E-R, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, Listen to what he says. He says, uh, he says, thank you for helping us preserve heritage seeds for the future and for fighting gene-altered frankenfood. So this guy is not, is not out here producing frankenfood. So I wanted to start off by telling him, number one, I think famine's coming. Number two, you need seed. And next time, and we're going to talk about this thing of what do you do if you live in the city, which, was, which is where most of you are right now? You're locked up in the city, see? And if you're locked up in the city, <clears throat> how are you going to feed your family? Now, I don't care much for New York City, but the guy says he lives in the suburbs. And if this guy lives in the suburbs and he has a 50 by 100 foot lot, and I'm going to assume that he's got a couple, three bread snappers at home, I used to have two or three of those. And then you got to feed these these children. you got to feed yourself. Did you know you can do that right there on your 50 by 100 square foot lot in your own city? So if you, if you uh, are getting a little nervous like I am, then you want to get prepared for the future. And if you can't leave and come to Missouri, well, okay and you're locked into Houston, Texas, or Cleveland, Ohio, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, you can feed your family right there on your lot. And I'm going to show you how next time, right here on the Law Hour and Editorial Review. But meanwhile, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to have to remind you that you're listening to the Law Hour and Editorial Review, sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, the Law Hour is heard seven days a week here in the United States and around the world in more than 120 countries daily over the Internet and radio. For more information about the Law School and the Law Hour, please go to our website at georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. Remember, the Law School is a private, non-commercial, non-profit, non-sectarian law school that is open to individuals, but by prearrangement. The Law School conducts a homeschooling program for adults on compact disc, and the Law Hour and 
uh, website is updated weekly. It has our radio log schedule and archives, all of which can be accessed through our website at georgegordon.org. The Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. Hey, our time's up. i got to leave it right there. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Same time, same station. God willing, of course. So until then, thanks for listening, everybody, and good night, friends.